We're back and we have another very exciting show for all of you. We have today with us my friend Hans Messerschmidt and he's going to be talking all about his experiences growing up in Nepal, as well as the connections we find with Buddhism, Tibet, and what's really in China. As of recently, we've been talking a lot about the Denisovans, we've been talking about their connection with ancient migrations and going over into Egypt, as well as the secrets of the ancient Hungarians and how this all comes into the big picture. Of course, we know that China has these five autonomous provinces. They have mummies there, they have pyramids, they don't talk about them. And I have never encountered someone that knows more about these parts than Hans. Hans, can you tell everyone about yourself? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Johnny, for the introduction. Um, so I grew up in Kathmandu, Nepal. I lived there primarily about 10 years of my life. Uh, my father was there early in the 60s in the Peace Corps, and then he came and did his doctoral dissertation in anthropology, studying in a remote village group um, called Sikrung, which is very near to where the uh, 2015 earthquake uh, epicenter happened in Gorkha district of Nepal. Um, as a result of growing up in Nepal, I lived there literally from four until I was graduated from high school. There's a, a unique international school there. And it was a really eye-opening experience um, on so many levels because Nepal is such a multicultural country. It has pretty much every religion you can think of there, as well as cultural shamanism, Buddhism, um, Buddhist shamanism, and, and other um, related topics around shamanism and mysticism um, of, let's say, the Mahabharata and, and other epic tales that, that come out of this area. Um, growing up, uh, we grew up around a lot of shaman practice. There's a lot of religious holidays that go on in Nepal. There's one happening right now called um, Dashai. And during Dashai, they sacrifice an animal, uh, usually a chicken, a goat, or a buffalo, depending on your wealth or status. And then they basically take the blood from the animal, sprinkle it all over your moving parts, your bicycle, your plow, anything that you use on a, on, on a basis to help, um, to help provide uh, technology in a sense to, to your daily life. So if you're farming, you know, your plows, if you're driving around, it's your cars. If, if you have a bicycle, it's your bicycle as, as said. And then they, they basically split up the animal and, and, and have an amazing feast. And during Dashai, this is where a lot of the shamans come out. There's a lot of shamanistic practice. There's a lot of magic that goes on around the actual sacrifice. Uh, they, they haul this giant machendra knot through Kathmandu, it often falls over, but it's this huge four wheeled tower that they build out of bamboo and wood. And the Kumari goddess sits inside of it. She's, she's a young virgin that they, they doll up and they cart her all over Kathmandu from temple to temple to temple to temple, uh, going through different practices. And so there's, there's like the Shiva temple, it's Wambu, I mean, at, uh, at Pashpati, then they go to the, like the Buddhist temples, they go to the Nag Pokri, the, the famous snake lake, and, and all over up into Patan, the old Patan Durbar. And so there's, there's a lot of this interesting mysticism going on. And between September and February, Kathmandu, Nepal becomes very foggy. And so it has this, this rich mystery and, and ambience in the air of, of what, you know, of magic basically. And, and it's, it's, it's an interesting place for sure. I definitely think that those parts contain a lot of ancient secrets and mysticism. When we think about going back into the common era, you had all sorts of mysticism found in our ancient traditions. And you can find mysticism in any of our ancient religions. If you go back into Buddhism, there was a very, very different version of Buddhism that was being practiced that yes. when you look at Mahayana Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism, all the arhats at one point they were being chased out of India, essentially, when there was this particular spread that we saw of Hinduism later on, when you had all these different gods that showed up. And what, what happened is that they started fleeing up into those parts. You look over in Tibet. Uh, but in a sense, you know, we saw that within Judaism, they had Kabbalah. You had a lot of mystical right. Christianity. You had Jacob Bami and these uh, various mystics and early saints. And so I truly believe that when you look at the migration of Buddhism, for example, you found that there was 
different types of it, depending where you looked. If you looked at China, Korea, Japan, Myanmar, compared to what you would have seen up in Tibet, Nepal, and all these, these places. I've even heard of there being types of sound and levitation being connected up in Tibet and uh, those nearby areas. Have you ever looked into that? I have actually, and there's there's the famous story of the monks that lifted the boulders up the mountain, blowing the long the long horns that they use. And uh, it's interesting because these horns are used just about everywhere. When you're in Bhutan, you go to some of the sacred monasteries, and in the morning they start blowing the horns, and so it it starts the energy of the day, and you know starts prepping everything that happens in the Buddhist monastery. And then they light all their butter lamps, and they you know they give puja and prayer toward all the enlightened beings of the planet and hope that we come to a collective consciousness. And then they move in, you know, to all their different ritualistic practices, uh, especially in Bhutan. Um, Kathmandu, there, there, there's a lot of Buddhist practice, Swambu, Pashpati, Bodhanath. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on at these, these temple sites. But when you get into Bhutan, you're stepping back four or 500 years into the past and seeing some of these amazing zongs and temples uh, in Bhutan where they have very different practices. And uh, I mean, they're very similar, but they're, they're different in their own because they're rooted from a different age of Buddhism. And so they get into deep meditation, they get into, you know, incredible, you know, religious practices as well, reading the scripts. Um, as far as levitation goes, I, I would not surprise me if this is happening as well. Once somebody gets into a deep meditation, uh, there's a place in Bhutan where they, they worship this, um, Worship's not quite the great word, but they 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 revere this this monk called uh, Drakpa Geltsin, and he was known to levitate his his instruments um, when he went into deep meditation. He would levitate himself. He could call into the future and bring back ideas from the future, and predict things. And he was a really interesting character. And where they they revere him in Bhutan is this little tiny tiny zone in the middle in the middle of nowhere. And there's a room that's incredibly dark and black, uh, like pitch black. And the monks will go in there and they will wear this chain mail that's incredibly heavy. And they'll walk their circles around inside of this room, meditating and doing their, their prayer in hopes that they don't lift off mentally and spirit, spiritually out of their body and not be able to come back. And so it's, it's fascinating that they will wear these chain mail garbs uh, while doing their meditation. I don't think I've ever seen this anywhere else. So, that, that just yeah. goes to show the ancient secrets of, of mysticism and these teachings right. that made their way <laughs> up there. And a conversation I've had with you as well as with Jujana when we were all talking, which is very interesting because I've also had similar conversations with uh, my friend Ishvan Dudic, who in, in Budapest in Hungary, he is connected to the embassy. And We've talked about there's very interesting connections that the Hungarians have you know, over into Asia and these particular areas for Thailand. When I've been talking to you, we have looked at some of what you were saying earlier about the shamanistic practices in these particular right. places being like the Hungarian shamans. And the Hungarian shamans were known as the Taltosh. And oh, they had all kinds of strange things and, and connections to these parts. For example, the ancient Hungarian, when we look at it, looks very much like the ancient Chinese. And hmm. the, the characters there are very strange, but they also have a map. And the map that they have is kind of a strange one that shows that there's a migration path that looks like that comes from Mars to how folks got here. And funny enough, people could look this up, all the earlier Nobel Prize winners and, and things of that sort that we see even like the progress that was on the atomic bomb and everything, when we look at where that was coming from, it was all coming from these Hungarian scientists that we call the Martians, funny enough. Interesting. What do you know about the connections between the Hungarian shamans and the, Hung and the shamans from those parts? Well, there is a direct connection between Hungarian shamanism and, and Nepalese shamanism. Um, if you go up into the village groups, uh, Nepal is an interesting place in its own. There's 42 subsects of people. And so a lot of these people have their own languages, they have their own practices. Um, and you go up into some of these villages in the Gurung Valley and the, the shamans are just fascinating people. And their, their practices, you know, the, there's a lot of sacrifice stuff that goes on, but, but then their practice goes into healing and um, 
fertility rituals and uh, all sorts of things. Um, my sister had a hard time um, conceiving. And so her husband at the time, her, his father was the village shaman as well. And he came into Kathmandu and he prayed and did puja with her for three or four days. And then he basically said, hey, we're going to cut the head off this chicken. We're going to pour the blood in a glass. You're going to drink the glass right now and you'll be pregnant like this. And unbelievably, it worked. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's, there's definitely some, some crossover ties. When I was looking into uh, doing some of this research into the, the DROPA studies, when we first initially talked about this, I started finding these connections between Hungary and Nepalese shamanism as well. And this, this kind of gets into this group of nomadic people that wander from central China all the way into Azerbaijan and up probably into Hungary and yes. bringing religion and practice and, and their own you know, dialect. They speak Chine, which is a, is a very strange pre-Sanskrit dialect. And so how, how far back they go, uh, who knows? I mean, if they're, if they're pre-Sanskrit, that's pretty far back. It's, yeah, it's then, fascinating when we look at the history of the Hungarians with the Hunnic people and the Scythians and the connections that go across those places. Absolutely fascinating, as well as what we see up in the Ural Mountains. But you mentioned something very important, and I wasn't sure when we were going to get into it, but let's get into it now. Let's talk <laughs> about the Dropa Stones. Now, yes, definitely. <laughs> these these are absolutely fascinating. I believe this is one of those things that, again, China and other folks don't want us asking too many questions around, and they're one of the great mysteries. Can you tell folks what they are and what's been found on them? So the initial stories of the Dropa started coming out in the late 40s, early 50s, and ended up in a Russian magazine called Sputnik, as well as Russian Digest and some other some other magazines. I looked forever trying to find um, Sputnik magazine from 1962 where this came out of. And I found a version that's in French. And so a friend of mine is translating the two or three pages that are basically dealing with the, the Dropa connection. But it, it, it talks about these stones coming out of China into the, the old Soviet um, countries and being being tested on. And so they were testing them for um, acoustic resonance. Uh, they were testing them for materials. They were discovering that a lot of these were jadeite with um, cobalt and mercury infusion, which is fascinating because this gets into you know ancient aircraft and vimanas and and, and mercury, <laughs> yes, and, and connections to Mars as well. And so M Mars could kind of be a, a way station on the way to Earth. For, for other extraterrestrial races, or it could be something that we also went to in the past. And if you look in the Purana Vedas, it, it talks a lot about the sun erupting and the, the people of earth having to leave in their Vimanas and go to someplace called Mahar. And Mahar, we believe is Mars. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And they stayed there for a thousand, 2000 years waiting for the earth to replenish, you know, replenish itself and be vegetated again. But while they were there, their skin color changed, their eyes turned blue and green, their hair was very red, very auburn red. And we see this connection throughout this whole South Asian um, area. And so a lot of the Dropa people and Drupa, uh, Dropa people who are coming out of central Tibet, they look like this as well. They have very red, reddish skin. Their hair is also very auburn and they're all about four foot three. So it, it's fascinating. Um, a, a, after that, the stones themselves started showing up in, in popular books and, and other articles. Uh, there was a, a book written um, in the early 80s, late 70s called Sun Gods in Exile, which is where a lot of the, the popularized story of the Dropa Stones comes out of. And that, that's a very hard to get an expensive book. This is an incredibly hard book to find. Um, <laughs> I had to hunt and hunt it down. There's an amazing bookstore here in Portland uh, called Cameron's Books that has some of these amazing old relics. And so finding these things have been some pretty fascinating. And in, in my research, I figured I better, you know, have as much uh, as much as this as possible because I'm I'm incredibly fascinated in this story. And at first glance, some of it just doesn't make sense. Uh, but then you start looking into it more and more and it it seems like a cover-up story. Like there's there's been specific things that have been left out or changed or transliterated into other languages so that 
we can't really connect the dots of the story. Uh, abs and so, abs absolutely. No, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, please continue. But I, I just want to jump in there before you go further. I want to bring back something you had said. You were talking about the idea that extraterrestrials could have stopped off on Mars. Now, let's, yes. let's just examine that for a moment. So Edgar Rice Burroughs, he had written, you know, the likes of Tarzan, <laughs> yes. also John Carter of Mars. John Carter that, of Mars. Yeah. That goes back to 1910. And I believe much like various stories that we get, whether you get Star Trek or Star Wars or various stories, some of these stories have been relayed to us. And whether it's Gene Roddenberry telling you it and his Writers right. Guild, a lot of the principles really do make sense and they add up. Zachariah Sitchin, who he had written a lot about the Anunnaki, which he was talking about. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are either Sitchin fans or detractors. He said something very similar when he was talking about Marduk and the Agigi or the Watchers going over to Mars and how there was the, an operation going on there. And I very much believe there was a civilization there. In fact, the guy that we based Indiana Jones off of, when you go hmm. back to George Lucas and Spielberg, when we look at George Hunt Williamson, he was let go of his job in archaeology and anthropology because he was saying the exact same thing. He was saying that, hey, we, right. we came from Mars. That was his whole message over at the University of Arizona and New Mexico, then later in Colorado. So there's something there for sure. And because there is a connection to the Hungarians as well as the Tal Tosh or their shamans saying the exact same thing. Again, there's a Mars migration. There's these folks coming here. There's a very interesting pattern. But the story we get about the Dropa is that folks are saying 12,000 years ago that those disks show that the greys or extraterrestrial groups who came here as scientists and explorers. What is your take on that? Well, that's, I mean, it's fascinating that that 12,000 year ago um, time marker is there because this is, this is when the Hallocene Comet event happened. And apparently at the time, I, I believe Dr. Robert Schock believes that there was also an outburst from the sun. And so if we had craft flying in and out of our solar system, you know, doing surveying of the earth uh, in the Dropa story, they actually came here about 20,000 years ago and then wow. returned 12,000 years ago to kind of pick up the pieces and see, you know, where the culture that they had left here was. And, you know, if, speaking of Gene Roddenberry, this kind of gets into, um, the, the prime directive, you know, do, do, do they intermingle with us or do they, do they watch us from afar? And so it, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that we would send back or they would send back a group um, of their people to kind of pick up where the other group had left off. But if there was an outburst from the sun, there is a possibility that their navigation and their ability to get here was cut off or was disrupted. And so it's interesting that they crash landed when Earth was going through this huge upheaval. The stars fell from, you know, fell from the sky. You know, comet broke up, uh, took down pretty much a lot of the ice sheets, literally from, you know, upper Alaska all the way down into the Middle East. You can find pieces and fragments of this comet. And and so it's interesting that in the middle of China, there would be this crash. And so, as the story goes, you know, the Dropa crashed. Um, they basically had to hide because the local, the local people, this Ham tribe, um, were hunting them down. They were invaders. Nobody knew who these people were. They, they kind of look like us, but they don't. You know, there's a genetic cousin aspect to them, um, which is fascinating. And then they hid in these caves, and they ended up burying a lot of their dead in the caves. And this is, this is where these discoveries started coming out. And so in in Sputnik magazine, there is this story of this Dr. Chi Pute who comes out of, you know, the, the Beijing uh, Academy of Sciences um, out of Peking. And so it's fascinating that he leads a team up into this remote area of the Bayan Har Shan mountain range. And there, there are a lot of Buddhist caves where there's a lot of artwork in the caves. There's a lot of, um, ceremonial burials in these caves as well. Um, the Tibetans like to, you know, Tibetans, the Buddhists in general like to bury their dead uh, in two different ways. They would either bury them or they would leave them uh, in the mountains for the birds to basically eat. So there was a sky, they call it a sky burial in a sense. And so they, they were looking for this stuff and they stumbled into this cave and found 
wow, uh, all these shortened people, you know, yellow skin, blue eyes, mummified, buried, and along with them were these dropa stones, and they're all about a, a foot in diameter with a hole, a circular hole in the middle. <laughs> and they ended up uncovering about 716 of these in, in total and thought that there was a possibility that there was a story being told on them. It could have been the history of the Dropa. It could have been a history of them crashing on Earth, as well as on the cave walls. There's depictions of all of the stars you know, in the sky. And like you said, this map that shows that the Dropa came out of the Sirius star system into our solar system and then crash landed on Earth. And so if you if you look into some of the work that um, Nassim Haramain talks about, he's talking about basically uh, cinder cones and volcanic tunnels being passageways as well. And so the, the, the question is, did they come via wormhole and ended up you know, crashing in, in, in the Tibetan mountains? Or were they already in our solar system? And like I said, this giant uh, outburst of the comet and the, and the solar outburst happened and that that forced them to crash land. Either, either way, they weren't able to return. They weren't able to rebuild their craft and they were stranded very remotely in the middle of Tibet. Can you show us what is on the Dropa stones, uh, the, the various depictions and how this, how this extraterrestrial depiction looks that you just talked about? Certainly. So in, in Sun Gods in Exile, there's an amazing photo in the beginning of it of the Dropa stones. And so there's two of these discs that um, a gentleman found in Missouri, India. And the, the story is about this Dr. Carol Robin Evans, who then follows, he's so fascinated with, with these stones that he follows their story into Tibet, trying to find the origin of where these came from and ends up meeting these Dropa people like in the remote area of, of Tibet where we're talking about. It's, it's on the border of what was Tibet and, and China now. And so it's in the central area of, of Tibet. But the stones themselves um, depict a, a spiral groove. There's, there's uh, markings on it that are very similar to the Bent Waters and Roswell markings that were found. Um, some of the elements of the stone are very similar to the um, fertility stone that's in a collection of Klaustana, where it shows basically lizard creatures, there's octopus, there's, there's an alien gray of sorts, um, there's a vimana, and there's a sun. And the sun basically could be the sun of Sirius. And as we know, Sirius A, B, and C have two or three um, planets that surround them, one of them being a water-based planet. And so when you get into the Dogon mysteries, Dogon, yes. Dropa, there's, there's a similarity there in, in transliteration of name. Uh, in their belief, they came from Sirius as well, and it was a water-bearing planet. And their gods are called the Namo. And they're also, they're, they're like these dolphin human creatures. And so it, it's fascinating that you have this connection with the Dogon, but then the Dropa also have a very similar tale. They're coming from Sirius. And so I started looking into this, this pattern of research between all these ancient cultures talking about an origin of Sirius. We all came out of Sirius. And so my, my fascination with that was, okay, if we're coming out of Sirius, <laughs> what, where, where else does this fall in? Does this, is this something that is discussed openly in Buddhism or is it part of Buddhist cultural mysticism? Because a lot of these uh, Dropa are coming out of this area of, of Tibet and, and out of this area of Buddhism. And so is there a serious connection with Buddhism? And there is. I mean, it's, it's incredibly fascinating. I, I think you said that very well. Diodorus of Sicilia said in the Bibliotheca Historica, he mentions that there's a connection with Osiris, who we've always associated with Orion, but he mentions a connection directly with Sirius within his name. And that's around 50 BCE. He makes that connection, which is fascinating. And there's most certainly a connection all throughout Egypt, we know, with the mysteries, right. not only with Sirius appearing in the sky and the flooding of the Niles and the, the importance of that when we bring that into the picture. But again, there is a connection with the, the Hungarians, shamanism, Ata Isis, 
as well as what we find in in their writings and teachings and that would be fascinating to have Jujana join us on a round table conversation and compare these yeah. across the board i i also think it's really fascinating your growing up your upbringing where you where you were immersed into this you have a very interesting <laughs> connection to graham hancock and his family don't you hey yes <laughs> So I went to school with uh, with Santa, his wife's children, uh, at the International School in Kathmandu, which is oddly enough called Lincoln School. It's the only international school in the area that doesn't have an international school name associated with it. <laughs> so, and it 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 took a while for me to to put the two together, and I went, "Oh, Graham's married to Santa. I know Santa's children. This is this is a small world." And I grew up, you know, reading you know, magicians of the gods and, and fingerprints of the gods and got very fascinated in in these ancient cultures and ancient, you know, mysticism that even Graham is talking about. And so, you know, dovetailing back to the Dropa, there, there is this interesting connection there. And so you 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 start looking into, okay, so if the Dropa people you know landed in 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 China and then started migrating out possibly to find others of their tribe this is where you have this connection of the 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 dropa ending up going through asia and ending up in azerbaijan and and hungary and and that area of the world and they keep changing their name in association as they move across you know the the globe and so it starts with the dropa then it becomes the zopa then it becomes the drukpa then it becomes the brokpa the further east or further west you go. And so uh, it, it's fascinating to follow these lineages. And I didn't really consider any of this until I went to Bhutan in 1998. And we're way out in Tashigang, which is out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, my dad was out there teaching at the University of Forestry. He was doing a lot of forestry projects with the local Bhut Bhutanese. And walking through the middle of the town and village you know, township that he lived in is this little tiny guy. He's wearing this spider wool cap. He's got this, you know, rinky smile on his face. He doesn't speak, you know, any of the dialogue and he's just wandering through. And I, I asked my dad, who, what is this? Who is this? And he says, oh, these are the Drogba. And it, it, it clicked. I'm like, the Drogba, where have I heard this before? And so it, it started bringing up my memories of hearing of the stories of the Dropa through, um, uh, Eric von Daniken, you know, in his amazing works early on. And so I, I just I, it started putting these connections together. And I'm like, who are these people? Uh, it's very fascinating where my dad was in, in Bhutan as it is, because right next to literally across the street from where he lived is the gate to the Magoy Sanctuary. And so they have a wildlife sanctuary for Magoy. And for those who don't know, Magoy is the, the local name for the Yeti. And so there's also obviously a connection with Bigfoot and Yeti and UFOs. Uh, so <laughs> this this has always, you know, been been somewhat fascinating um, in that aspect. But then going back to the stones themselves, the stone in the book um, by uh, David Agamon is interesting because it describes one aspect of the stone. But if you get into the story of Chipute and Sung Nui who is another character who ended up studying these stones in the 40s, um, they describe them very similarly to bi disks, which are literally unknown what they were used for. They were buried with the royalty or upper class of, of ancient China. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, unfortunately, a lot of these things got sh snuffed away and buried and didn't end up you know, in museums until like the early 80s and, and, and mid 80s when they started coming back out of this. And I actually happen to have a buy disc, but this is very similar to what um, the Dropa stones were described as, you know, it's this round foot, foot size disc. It's made out of jade, solid jade. Um, a lot of them are cobalt and mercury infused as, as said, which creates a piezoelectric effect as well as other, you know, effects. And then they would be inscribed with magic, lore, legends, um, of sorts and so these could be considered protection they could be considered wealth but then they also have this older lineage to the dropa and it, so it, it also makes us think though if they're infused with these things they give them that piezoelectrical effect and again we connect that over to quartz we connect that over just like granite 
that maybe they were part of some sort of mechanism or a, a record keeping system. Yes. Because yes. I'm, I'm sure that you've heard that there's all kinds of connections up even in uh, Buchechi, in the Transylvania mountains. Uh, there's right. been what Peter Moon and Radu Sinemar called the Transylvanian Sphinx, where there was an ancient record keeping system that worked like a projector. Some have said, was that underneath the Sphinx of Egypt? Could this have told the stories of ancient time and let us know, and we just happen to stumble upon these? When we look at those parts, and I want to bring you back a bit, Hans, we look at those sure. parts, Look, think about the legends that we get with even looking over at Shambhala or the secrets that are in the Gobi Desert. I truly believe there's two places on the planet where you're going to find a lot of lost ancient technology. Definitely the Gobi. Like, yeah, Gobi Desert as well as under the Sahara. Those are the two places where we're going to still keep finding it. And it's still found all the time. Very classified stuff has been found there. Now, if we go back and look at the Nazis, the Nazis with the Vril Society, they were obsessed with the work of uh, Edward Bulwer uh, Leeton, who in 1871, he had the coming race. And we look at these mm. advanced beings they were talking about, and we look at Agartha and the maps of what's under the earth. Well, all those parts, whether you talk about Shambhala, whether you talk about what's in the Himalayan mountains, and in those areas, there's a huge set of focus, even in the stories we get of Saint Germain, where are we told that he would go? Where did St. Germain? In, into the mountains. Yeah, That's right. Right up there in those areas. Uh, that's yeah. where, we went, uh, where he went. So I want to ask you, when we bring all this connection about into the secrets of ancient China, why that is so important. Uh, and I, I think they're, what the group that we call Atlantis, if you want to connect it into these areas and ancient groups, Lemuria and Mu and all that, uh, I think we got to look into those parts because a lot of during the the last ice age when we go from the pleistocene into the holocene and everything europe was all under ice that's what people are forgetting yeah. but we see this migration migration from northern india we see this migration from asia we see those groups held the secrets for a very long time and uh, when we look over why this secret of the tarim mummies and the pyramids have been covered up and what the emperors really knew what is your take on that? What is your take on those pyramids and the mummies that have been found? Uh, in, in Egypt or all over Asia? I mean, in, well, in I'm China. Talking about, well, not only the ones that we find in, in Egypt, which have a very similar practice, but when we look at the ones that have been over at the Tarim mummies over in China, we have this connection going back to something like 1800 BCE, uh, even uh, they they found they found mummies in China that were very well preserved. Uh, there's one of a woman. She has red hair. She has this yellow yellowed skin, you know, weathered skin, very rich green eyes, and her the carbon dating of her was like six thousand BCE. So, to me, that that kind of leads into some of you know this this other. Um, scenario with with the Dropa themselves, because when they found these very well preserved bodies, you know, buried in this cave, they also were mummified. And they, I yes. mean, even though they were short in stature, they have a very similar look to this woman that they had found. They have, you know, they had yellowed skin and blue eyes and um, had been very well preserved because there's, there's not a lot of moisture up in these mountains. And so like in, in Egypt, there's a there's a way of preserving mummification that doesn't allow the body to rot. And so I've, I've always found this fascinating because we today have not been able to figure out the secrets of the mummies. Um, yeah, well, in, in 2008, uh, I, I believe that's when National Geographic was allowed to go in there. And there's been a few groups that were allowed to do tests and all this stuff started to come out. And then all of a sudden it died down. No one wanted to talk about it. Yeah, it's just... Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just like the antiquities in Egypt when you had Gattenbrink go up into the Great Pyramid. And we right. were just talking about this on the last show. And he's in there 93, 94. And they find this mysterious writing at the top. He is all of a sudden in a position where he's not allowed to talk about it. He isn't right. allowed to go any further. He has to back away from it. It's too controversial because it challenged the historical narrative of the idea that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians could have been the ones that did this, right? 
Right. And uh, it, it's interesting that you do find pyramidal structures on every continent and, and all over. I mean, many. Uh, some of them are naturally made. There's one here um, outside of where I live in, in, in Washington, central Washington. It's called Mount Tum Tum. Um, it's a cinder cone, but having been there, it's terraced. Uh, it was, it's been reused for forestry projects, but it, as you drive up to it, it, it's, it's remarkable because it doesn't look like a cinder cone. It looks like a pyramid <laughs> and it's just sitting there in the middle. I mean, there's rolling hills around it, but then there's this pyramid and you're like, what is this? How old is this structure? Um, and obviously the question is, how are these things built? Um, Obviously they were, we have the evidence of them being built and myself having traveled to Peru and having traveled to Egypt, you know, you, you go there with your BS meter in the red and a hundred questions and a week later you leave with a thousand questions and your BS meter is completely shattered because you start realizing what, what am I looking at here? What, what is this? How old are these cultures? Um, and then coming back to your, your question about Atlantis, well, in Atlantis, we were using, you know, ancient technologies uh, according to Edgar Casey and a lot of his readings that dealt with what we would call Vimana tech. And so if, if these bi discs or, or dropa stones are infused jade with mercury and cobalt, could they have been like we would use in a computer today, discs that would help drive the machine or have instructional manuals, you know, related to them. Uh, they, they all oscillated when they were put through the oscillation tests. Uh, they created a buzzing sound. Um, some of them had microscopic engravings on them. And so this is where they got a lot of the story aspect from. Um, but yeah, the, the, the ultimate question is, okay, you're, you're in this area of Asia and you have these devices. Are they part of the craft? You know, were these a leftover piece? of the craft that were buried with with um, the dropa and so we don't know i mean the, the the mystery behind that is is incredible but it's it's completely unknown but the fact that they're infused with cobalt and and mercury just makes it even more fascinating because if you look at how some of the ancient you know vimanas were described to have run uh they were using some sort of mercury as as a plasma propulsion or or a way of generating energy uh much like they were trying to do with the bell um, the Glocke in, in, in Germany during the war. I mean, they, they sunk so much time, energy, and money into this project. It was considered, you know, a wartime project that, that surpassed even their nuclear projects that they were working on because they re realized if they could figure out this ancient technology of spinning up red mercury and, and some other substances, then we have anti-gravity and flight and, 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 you know, a weaponized system that is, surpasses anything uh, as dr joseph farrell always says you know the the bell if weaponized correctly would make a, a, a nuclear weapon look like a firecracker and so uh, these could have been what were powering these crafts and then walter bosley uh, started doing research into uh, the airship mysteries of of the u.s in the 1800s and a way that a lot of these crafts were described was very similar to Vibana tech. And they were also using a mercury-like substance. And so these, these all tie back to, okay, there, there's definitely something here with the Dropa stones and with the Dropa people because their technology could be utilizing mercury, cobalt, and, and other rare earth materials which we're using today in all of our electric vehicles. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's like, where, where do these ideas and where does this tech come from? Well, you have to start looking back, you know, further and further and further. And the mystery with the Dropa is, you know, like I said, after World War II and in the 60s, uh, the Chinese Cultural Revolution came in and all of this information was hushed, all of it. And only recently has some of it started coming out. And with all the disclosures going on right now um, through the CIA and, and some of the video footage that's been put out there, uh, they disclosed a whole bunch of stuff that they were studying about in Nepal and Tibet also during the 60s that just got disclosed recently. Yes. And so, okay, if they're looking into this, there, there is definitely something going on there. Um, that's, that is, that's, ex that's exactly right. And that is of when, when people talk about the Tartarians, they talk about the Tartars, mm -hmm. and they go look at their, their writings, we, we start to see connections to the Vinca. 
and the Vinca, yes. that's a very big piece of the puzzle. And the Vinca tied directly into this picture with the Hungarians, they tie into the, the ancient Chinese, they tie into these uh, ancient people that were in Europe that held all these secrets. And I believe that there were several what we call Ark of the Con, the uh, Ark of the Covenants, which was the Ark of the Contract. People say it's a Hebrew story, but it's an Egyptian story. It's far older, and we have these stories of groups. Even when you look into Genghis Khan, that we say over in Europe, they say Genghis Khan. When you look at Genghis Khan, and when you go look at the Mongolians, and you look at these invasions, <laughs> <laughs> and you look well, you look yeah. at these invasions that took place in in ancient Hungary, which was huge uh, during the time of uh, Bela the Fourth, during the Bela period, and other there was these right. massive invasions. The Templars got involved, massive massive invasions even into Russia in those times, uh, and it was very sad, you know how uh, all the lives that were lost in these these battles, but they had some sort of what was almost like a weapon or a technology. And what I've always said about the Ark of the Covenant, and there's so much there that when you look at that, you could take pure photonic energy with no mass and put it inside of a box. Uh, and you you have these these types of knowledge that were coming around the earth. It's it's obvious that the ancients knew very sophisticated ways to work in hard rock, how to levitate things. Uh, how to look at how to build pyramids. I, uh, when we look over in Egypt, as we were saying in the last show, that it's no doubt that the Sphinx is far older than the top part of the pyramid, that the basin right. and the temple below the Great Pyramid and what we call the subterranean chamber and what's under the Giza Plateau was there before. But who were the pre-cataclysmics? Who were the pre-dynastics that left their markings at Gatenbrink found, which are like the Vincan script, that are at that top part that works like this if you want to say amplifier or looks like this can that's creating electromagnetic energy and how it's being distributed i do think that there's a lot there hans i want to say that there's so much that you and i could cover and we we got to do more shows on this definitely and i know you have a lot more research that you've done on these things but is there anything you want to leave people to think about or research in the meantime uh, when they start looking into this well, there's a, there's a lot of stories out there on the Dropa. I mean, every single one of them starts off literally reading the Wikipedia um, <laughs> uh, aspect of it. And I, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to look further. I'm going to see if there are other connections here. And you were talking about Atlantis. We were talking about, you know, these wonder weapons and, and wonder machines and the, the serious star connection. And you start looking into Buddhism and they believed that Mount Meru was this way of either teleporting themselves to Sirius and back and bringing artifacts to Sirius and back. And there's a bunch of ascended masters that, that, that made this voyage. And so if there's ascended masters making this voyage, could there be other you know, characters and, and people making the same voyage? And so this, this ties back into the Dropa. It's like, okay, there, there's this group of people. They do exist. <laughs> they come out of central you know, Tibet and China. They're nomadic. They're, they're kind of a complete mystery. And there are now stories around where their origins were and, and what their origins were in, in China as well as um, coming from Sirius. And so I, I've been diving quite a bit into the research of this. I have a lot of um, fascinating stuff that I put together in a, in a mini, it's like a 45 minute documentary that I put together um, that's available online. And um, how, yeah, how can, I, how can people find it, Hans? And I'll, we'll put a link. So I, I, uh, we, we can definitely link it um, in, in the text, but uh, I, I have a YouTube channel called Giza Direct and I posted it on there uh, just, just to kind of get it out. I wanted um, some of my friend's opinions, uh, you as well, since you had put this amazing challenge together. So I, I, I dove you know, into it quite, quite well. Um, there are other stories as well in, in books like um, Aliens and UFOs of Ancient China. There's some fascinating tales in here about what's, what's going on and where people are coming from. Um, David Hatcher Childress puts together Vimana. Uh, there's a chapter in here that talks about 
the Dropa as well. And That's, that, the, that, that is a great book. And you know what I like that Childress says in there? Like, because he goes into Mahabharata, Mahabharata yeah. and he goes into the Samarangana Sutradhar and all that. When we examine these in different cultures, we could even find connections, let's say, into Buddhism with the pagodas that are floating. Right. In the so right. Very, very, very good book. And sorry, I know you have more books there, but that's a great oh, book. Oh, no, no worries. Check it out. The, the other great one is the Chinese Roswell by, um, uh, sorry, Hartwig Hausdorff. Uh, where he goes into China looking for the Dropa stones and ends up stumbling across stones in a Bompo museum. Um, this guy, Ernst Wergner, who was there doing photography, actually photoed them first. And so um, Hartwig Hausdorff was, was basically traveling all over China to see the pyramids. Uh, he ended up at the Bompo museum when he was talking to the people there about the Dropa stones or, or the Bidus that they had on display years before. Uh, he was hushed up very quickly, and the people that he had talked to were fired. And so there, there's, there seems to be some sort of a, a cover-up of knowledge, um, as there always is. Um, <laughs> as we know, there, there's a usurping of, of knowledge as well. And, you know, over the course of 12,000 plus years, I mean, if we're looking at when the Vimanas and the Mahabharata took place, I mean, it could have been 40,000 years ago. It could have been 40 million years ago. And it, it all depends on um, the astral, the astrological aspect of the stories, because each one of the Mahabharata stories of the 18 days of, of this amazing battle that took place between the demigods and the people of Earth, um, they talk about stars and the alignment of stars. And this is very, very important. And so when you go back into the Dropa story, into the caves, they're also talking about stars and the alignment of stars. And so it would be super fascinating if China would ever let us in to go to go on an expedition and try and find this, this area and, and these caves, because what comes out of this area is where the Yelong and the Yangtze rivers are. And when they built the Three Gorges Dam and some of the other dams, they flooded a lot of these caves. And a lot of the cultural, you know, Buddhism and artifacts that were there are gone. I mean, you'll never see them again because they're underwater. And so um, it's 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 interesting. They did something similar in Egypt when they when they dammed uh, the the Nile at Aswan. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. When the Soviets came it's in, there so much the underwater there that they they moved the Temple of Isis uh, to the island of Philae. They moved um, Abu Simbel, which is, you know, the original cave system is underneath the dam and they moved it up and like, oh, there's nothing to see here except these amazing <laughs> statues. And if you go like, again, if you go into the King's Chamber, uh, not King's Chamber, into the Great Pyramid and you go down into the basement area, there's other tunnels down there as well. There's the dead end shaft, which I've been to the end of twice. Uh, I don't think it's a dead end shaft. I think it's been cemented over and there's a drill hole through the wall. And it, it kind of ends up pointing toward where the Osiris shaft is as well and other structures under Giza. And so you have these artificial cave systems that we're building and then you have these natural cave systems that we're utilizing. And so there's, there's these, these connections between both. Um, there, there, there definitely is a connection between the both. Hans, I wanna thank you for joining us today. And yes, how, definitely. outside of the Giza connection, uh, the, yes. <laughs> Giza the, Direct. Yeah, yeah the, the Giza Direct connection that you have there. Where can people find you? Uh, is it mainly on YouTube or do you have a website and email that's updated for them? Um, I, I have a couple of websites. Um, one of my websites I'm still updating is called megamist.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Megamist is a, kind of a shortening for megalithic mysteries. And it highlights my trip to Peru, um, the people that I went with, the knowledge you know, of the people that I went with and my first trip to Egypt, um, where our guide was your good friend and my good friend, Mohammed Ibrahim. And, uh, and some of the knowledge that just came out of both of those trips, I mean, blew my mind because I, I got to see things that a lot of people just do not get to see. That's, that's it. And we, we also have another very good friend together is Brian Forrester. Oh, and Brian Forrester. Yes, of course, who, who took me on the tour in, in Peru and was also on the two tours I've been on in Egypt. And just mind mind blowing wealth of knowledge uh, between all these people that that I've traveled with, 
and it just it unfolds so many stories and i can't wait to go on a trip with you as well <laughs> we are you, you have another you have another amazing insight to all this that <laughs> I, I don't think a lot of people have put together so well so so are you brother and it's so good to have you on the show and i want to say that i want to have you back and we'll do another one of these or another few because we have so much that we have to cover that we can't get in a one segment i want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experiences with everyone and I hope you all watching this have enjoyed it. Remember to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And don't forget to go out and check out Hans's YouTube channel, his pages, and stay tuned for more.